Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Septic Systems 101. Uh, this is our um, annual septic webinar uh, we try to hold every July uh, for the private well class. And I um, want to mention the private well class is at the University of Illinois at the Illinois State Water Survey. Um, we're funded, sponsored, and uh, graciously supported by RCAP, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, and funding through US EPA. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm going to get started. Uh, first things first, if you are um, an EHP or someone who uses NEHA's credentials or Illinois EH, LEHP credit, this webinar is worth two hours of credit through those two organizations. Um, as far as NEHA goes, their credentialing cycle is two years. The example I use today is if your credentialing cycle just started on 7-1 this year, um, we offer this every July typically, um, and those are the last two shown on the bottom right. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get credit for it again until um, after 6.30.25. And so we can provide uh, the certificate of attendance. There's handouts in the GoToWebinar screen that you can download. Uh, copy of the slide deck if you need that, and uh, we can help you with uh, the NEHA forms. And um, yeah. That's that. So today's webinar is part of a national program, again, implemented through RCAP. We work with their six regions who are the boots on the ground part of uh, this whole effort to work with well owners around the country. Um, these materials do follow our class lessons, but this is not the private well class 10 lesson course that you find at privatewellclass.org. You sign up, it sends you an email once a week with a PDF that makes up the 10 lessons. Um, we do record every webinar, including today's, and as such, we put them all on YouTube, and I'll show you that later, but um, folks are free to go and watch those at their leisure that way if they miss today. Um, as far as credit, though, you can only get credit um, if you're watching it live. And I forgot to take a bullet out. This is from last year. Um, we are still working from home part of the time. I'm not at home today. I don't have to worry about my daughter and her friends being loud or our service providers uh, or our neighbor mow in their yard as we have had to in the past. So now it's just maintenance workers here who are redoing our HVAC system, which I've asked not to bother us for the next couple hours. We'll see what happens. Okay, so again, I'm Steve Wilson. I'm a ground hydrologist uh, and be the, I'm presenting the material today, but we have Jim Starbird with us who's a licensed sanitarian in Massachusetts. He's with RCAP Solutions. He worked as a, a septic inspector for seven years prior to joining RCAP. He's the state lead in Massachusetts, someone I lean on all the time uh, with questions related to especially advanced systems and just, you know, Massachusetts has some of the strictest rules related to septic in the country. Uh, Jim's fluent in all of that and it's very, been very helpful to our program. Uh, Jennifer Wilson is with us today. She's our communications lead for the private well class and wateroperator.org. And uh, she's graciously agreed to help field questions today, um, which I might not have mentioned, but if you have any questions that come up during the webinar, um, we did get everyone's questions that you asked in advance. When you registered for the class or for this webinar, you were able to list questions. We had, I don't know, 70 or 80 questions that uh, we went through. Uh, Jim's going to answer most of those today, um, or that we put in here, probably about 15 or 20 of them. Um, but if you have other questions that have come up based on something that one of us says today or that you didn't ask in advance, um, put it in the chat or the question box on your GoToWebinar screen, and we'll track those today. And at the end, we'll pull those up and go through them. Um, yeah, and we're willing to answer questions as long as you're willing to listen. Okay, so first thing we need to do, uh, housekeeping again, is um, we have a poll question. Jennifer's gonna launch a poll question um, that uh, we need everyone to answer. Um, especially if you're getting credit, this is one way we track that you're actually paying attention, um, all that sort of thing. And it's a pretty simple question. Uh, what role best describes you um, as a participant today? I'll give everyone a minute to do that. Okay. 
We have uh, 265 people on so far today, and 85% uh, of you voted. Um, I think Jennifer just closed the poll. And uh, yeah, about half are uh, considered regulatory. Um, the rest are either health professionals or well owners, which is great, 22% well owners, and then a few other stakeholders and uh, well professionals. So thank you for filling that out, and uh, we'll get started. Okay, so um, I mentioned RCAP, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. Um, I wanna explain a little bit more about them because again, um, their folks like Jim are um, in their home states. They assist well owners uh, in person and help put on workshops in their states and those sorts of things. Um, RCAP is a partnership of six nonprofits that are regional in scope. So RCAC is a Western RCAP. They cover all the states out West. I'm in Illinois, so we're part of the Great Lakes Community Action Partnership. It's one of the states, and Cindy Brooks is a private well lead that I work with uh, whenever we have questions in uh, one of our states. And then uh, the other here, Communities Unlimited, CERCAP, uh, RCAP Solutions, where Jim's at. Um, All together, they have staff. Um, I think there's about 250 staff now, maybe a little more, covering all 50 states, including um, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and all those areas. And so um, whenever we get questions from well owners and it's something specific for a given state, then I'm forwarding that to Jim or Cindy or uh, somebody else, depending on where they're at, and so that they can work with those well owners directly. So it's a great network of people who um, they work. A lot of these folks are, um, if they're not private well professionals, they're professionals, either water or wastewater um, operators. Uh, in a lot of cases, and so they understand uh, the, the, you know, the business of drinking water and wastewater and all the things that are important to us. So um, if you want to get in contact with someone, if you're a professional and like to put on a, like a workshop in your area, whether it's a county or a district or whatever, um, let us know. We can get your information to the right RCAP region, and they can work with you to try to do that. Um, they can provide speakers, they can organize and set things up, um, or find other experts to participate in your workshops. Um, you know, the idea is there's 23 million private well owners out there. Um, oh, I mean, 23 million private wells, and that's about uh, 58 million people who rely on private wells. So um, the more the merrier, uh, more people involved with this that can help a lot of folks who don't understand their wells or their septic very well. Um, that's what we're here for. So quickly, a little bit about the water survey. I'm, I'm really proud of where I work. I've been here for a long time, um, but the water survey was started in 1895 because of cholera and typhoid outbreaks, and it was formed by the state legislature. So we're very similar to a state geological survey or a natural history survey. Illinois just happens to also have a state water survey, and we've done a lot of water quality and public health related work. Um, we did some of the seminal work in the early 1910s on wastewater treatment. Um, we've got a really cool history, and um, all of that's been archived. And uh, you know, looking through some glass plate slides that date back to 1900, we found a lot of cool things. Like this is from a book. It's a picture from a book, but it says uh, a schoolboy of average intelligence and mechanical ingenuity can, by following these plans, build a sanitary privy for his home. So the world we were in back in the, uh, you know, a little over 100 years ago. Um, what did I do there? Okay. Champaign-Urbana, where the University of Illinois is. Um, this was our Urbana's wastewater system. It's a large septic tank. Um, this is from 1912, I believe. Um, and it just goes to show how far we've gone. In 1924, uh, Champaign-Urbana put in uh, the a new treatment system. It's called the Urbana Champaign Sanitary District. It's still in force today, um, and that's what manages our wastewater resources for the community of 180,000 people now. Um, but this is where we were. That straight pipe is dropping right into uh, our Salt Fork uh, River. So um, conventional septic systems, which is what we're going to talk about today, uh, they're really wastewater treatment systems. They just like any other mechanical system, they have to be managed and maintained. Um, they rely on natural degradation by bacteria. Those bacteria come from us. They get into the septic system, they break down material, 
and then um, what's broken down can then go out into the drain field and harmlessly infiltrate into the natural system. So uh, there's a tank that separates the solids and gives bacteria time to basically break things down. Um, that tank will fill up with solids eventually if it's not pumped. Uh, that's one of the big things that uh, 20 people probably ask how often do I have to um, pump my septic tank and we'll talk about that and uh, give Jim a chance to provide some insight there too. Um, the liquids then leave through a piping system if it's got a traditional drain field and then that percolates into the ground where bacteria in the soil and in um, the shallow geology uh, further break that down and render it harmless. Okay, so uh, this, I apologize for this blurry diagram. I have a new one we, I just have forgot to put in here. Um, this is a typical system. You can see the house on the left, everything from the house, shower, toilets, sink, uh, dishwasher, um, comes into the septic tank. Um, the solids fall to the bottom or they float on top, depending on how dense they are. Uh, the first tank, this is a two compartment tank. Some are um, different than that. Then the uh, bacteria are in the solids in the bottom, breaking things down. Uh, there's a drain then out to the uh, absorption field, it's called here, the drain field, um, where everything uh, moves through that system. So a couple things, the amount of water that goes through this does matter, again, giving bacteria time. Um, and if you put things that are uh, whole solids, like uh, if you have a garbage disposal and you're putting parts of, uh, you know, orange peel and carrot ends and, you know, those sorts of things, um, those won't be broken down. It takes too long and they'll eventually build up in your system. So it's not recommended necessarily to have a garbage disposal, for instance, if you are, are on a septic. Um, just two other diagrams that we've used. Uh, there's more septic systems out there. This is 25 million homes based on what we knew a few years ago. But um, lately, um, it's about one in five homes, so it's probably higher than that. And I don't know if Jim has a better number uh, nationally, but um, I know we used to believe there was around 15 to 18 million private wells, but some work that's been done through US EPA over the last five years or so um, indicates it's closer to 23. And so there's just a lot of systems out there and more being built every day. Uh, this kind of shows a standard system. What it looks like, this is a single tank. Um, you've still got an outlet riser, and there's a filter on that to keep solids from getting into your drain field. The drain field typically has uh, these perforated pipes. Those can become plugged, which if that happens, um, the water doesn't have anywhere to go. It only goes through in one location or a few locations. It can really cause um, problems and eventually have material percolating up to the surface. So um, when they fail, which is everybody's big worry, um, you'll know um, a few things could happen. The area around your tank or your drain field could get uh, much thicker, greener grass um, because it's got all those extra nutrients and it's um, they're close to the surface. It could even pool water in your yard. Um, or someone actually sent me a video where their sod had been laid just the year before and there was leakage from their septic uh, up underneath that and they could step on their grass and it would create a wave as it moved across the yard. Uh, it's pretty crazy and the ground obviously was spongy in that case. Um, you'll notice a smell and in the worst case if it completely plugs it can back up into your home and if that happens especially if you have a basement uh, bathroom um, that's where it'll come out first typically and so to prevent this um, you need to understand how to maintain your system and why it's important to um, pump it regularly to make sure the solids don't get too uh, full and affect your system. So uh, the issues you really have as an owner of a septic system is understanding the size and the design um, and if it's still right for that situation. Uh, as an example, I know in Massachusetts they design systems based on the number of bedrooms. Um, and other states, they use the number of people in the home. Well, it may be a small home that was built for two. They eventually have four kids. Um, they expand their house, and now they've got six in the house. Um, they still have the same septic system. 
So that means they have to pump much more often because it's probably a smaller tank um, and that sort of thing. So you need, you need to know where it's at. We always have people ask, I don't know where my septic system is. And that's, um, that's a very common thing as it turns out. And it depends on um, your state and your local jurisdiction, what kind of information may be available to help you find that. Some states are very rigorous in their protection of septic and how they discharge and all those things and other states are more lax and there may not be records to help you. Um, yeah, and many septic owners don't understand what they need to do. They don't think they need to pump. I know there's always questions about uh, adding bacteria and people thinking that's gonna reduce the amount of uh, time you need to pump your system. That's not true. And uh, it really should have no bearing on how often you pump. So as far as um, understanding how often to pump, it's really based on size and the number of people in the home, as we mentioned. Um, the size of the drain field also matters depending on water use because you can overload that. And if the, the soil is of a type that um, only so much can percolate down uh, and you're overburdening that, then it's got nowhere to go but up and create a, a wet spot or um, leaching upwards to the surface in those cases. Um, knowing if it's designed properly, a newer home likely is, um, but many older systems, um, we've actually run across cases where there's uh, a septic tank and then a distribution box. And from that box, there's three or four lines uh, that are old clay tile running straight out into a field, uh, like field tile uh, for a you know cropped uh, acreage or straight to a stream or river. And uh, there's places, certainly in Illinois, where you see these small little cabin-like homes or homes near a river. And if you're canoeing down, uh, some of them still have a straight pipe coming out of the ground or coming out of the side of the, um, yeah. Uh, it's very bad, as I said here, and some are still that way. Um, okay. so. Um, if you have a straight pipe to the surface anywhere uh, in your system, uh, meaning either to a field tile or to a river or stream, consider what you're doing in the environment. It's illegal in most areas. Um, it may be in every state now. It used to not be, um, but there's uh, a lot of new regulations that you need to be concerned with. Do you know where your drain field is? Do you understand the groundwater flow direction? You know, the idea by having setback distances between your private well and your septic system are to prevent having that potential contaminant too close to your well, but it also matters what direction the water's flowing. Um, as, a, as an example, if you have a, a number of shallow wells in an area, maybe it's sandy, and so the water table's shallow, the aquifer's near the surface, and so the well may not be very deep, um, where you're at on the landscape matters. And if you're in a rural subdivision where there's multiple wells and multiple septic systems, the higher in elevation you are, water's probably running towards the lower elevation in the water table. And so if you're down on the low end of that subdivision, then there's much more of a risk of shallow groundwater um, if your well's shallow and isn't properly constructed. So understanding those things is important. Um, knowing where your water enters your well, meaning um, we just had a case where uh, there's a new cemetery going in in an area and several well owners contacted us because they're concerned about their wells. But when we looked up the geology, this was in Illinois, um, it turns out that there's mostly clay and shale for the upper 100 feet. And the wells are all cased through that to a limestone aquifer that starts at about 120 feet. And so that's very unlikely because of the geology that anything from near the surface is going to get into that aquifer. So they're really not at risk in that case because the material, their well's cased all the way through, so it's solid casing, nothing can get in the well until it gets down below 120 feet. And so that helps protect uh, from any surface influence. And in addition, it's also a clay or shale, which are considered aquitards or aquacludes, which means water doesn't move through them, if at all. And so um, in that case, they're protected. But if it's, um, well, there's, play, there's an area in New York I visited where bedrock's right at the surface and that is the aquifer. 
And so um, in some cases before there were rules, they may have only put casing uh, 20 feet into the ground and maybe the well is 300 feet deep or 600 feet deep, but the casing only goes to 20 feet, which means in a bedrock well, uh, of course somebody's mowing right now. Um, huh. In the case of a bedrock well, it matters how much casing you have. And so um, those older wells in New York I just mentioned, they're not protective because they only have 20 feet of casing. And then a lot of times a bedrock well, the, the hole you drill into the bedrock is the casing. The rock's not going to cave in. And so you don't put a uh, pipe down there. And so it really matters that you understand uh, those things about your well to understand what risk you might have from surface contamination, whether that be septic or anything else. So they have to be managed, just like I mentioned earlier. Um, they'll eventually fail. Proper management can prolong that. I know there's systems in place from before the 40s that still work just fine. Um, but again, you have to take care of it. You need to pump them on a schedule based on size and use. Um, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk in the questions about how to uh, a good way for you to figure that out. Don't put things that don't belong in your septic system, um, like toxics. Remember that it uses bacteria to break down all the material in the septic tank. So if you take all the amoxicillin from when one of your kids was sick and you dump it down the toilet, you're putting something that kills bacteria into your septic system. Uh, things like cat litter, grease, coffee grounds, they don't break down well. And so they will eventually clog your system or certainly fill it up faster. And uh, so they're just... Uh, those things don't belong. And so, uh, yeah, it's a matter of following those kind of best practices. Uh, don't put anything that is toxic, all that. Um, this is one example. Um, this is from the National Environmental Services Center in West Virginia University. And, uh, and they actually, this is on their web page, but it's from one of their documents, but it actually says up here, the source is Penn State Cooperative Extension. And so this kind of shows you based on number of people and the size of your tank, if you know it, how often you need to pump, assuming you're following all of uh, the best practices, including, as it says here, these figures assume there's no garbage disposal unit in use. Um, and the rule of thumb is if you have a garbage disposal, you probably need to pump twice as often. But if you have, you know, a, a, a thousand gallon tank and there's four people, um, every two and a half years, basically, 2.6, it says. And then, uh, so that's uh, probably every two years you'd want to pump your tank. And uh, you can then talk to your septic uh, person who's pumping your tank, ask them how full it is, um, if it's not even close to being um, at a point where it needs to be pumped yet, then you'll know maybe you can go an extra year and, and figure it out that way. Uh, that's uh, good practice. Um, so as far as your to-do list for that, um, it's about keeping everything clean around the area, especially no trees uh, on the drain field, no concrete or asphalt, things that'll compact the soil, only grass. Don't plan on doing anything else there. You need to be able to get to your inspection port and the manhole that comes if it's got both. Um, and trees especially are a huge problem because uh, the biological material in our septic is uh, great food for trees and tree roots, and they find their way into those. Uh, it's a huge problem. And so uh, the other thing to do is to reduce the flow of water into your system. It's not about um, not flushing every time because you're worried you're going to overload your uh, septic system, but you shouldn't do things like put your softener backwash or have your wool pool or a sump pump pump into that. Uh, they can put so much water through a system if, uh, especially a sump, if it's, you know, you have a lot of rain or whatever, um, that they don't give the material in the, your bacteria a chance to actually do any good. And so it's, it's about reducing the flow so your system can work properly. Um, and again, only put wastewater into your septic system. No garbage disposal stuff. Uh, no, you don't need any additives. Um, I know there's a big market for some of those things and there were actually several questions but all the evidence suggests that if you maintain your system properly, uh, there's enough bacteria that it's, uh, adding yeast or other things like that aren't going to help. 
And again, no man-made stuff, no paint, pills, anything like that. Um, and I put down here, inspect the tank regularly to measure the solids. Uh, that's not something a well owner or um, a septic owner can necessarily do that easily, but you can have somebody come out and do it a few times. It might cost you a little bit, but then uh, you have a better idea of where your tank sits and how often it might need pumped. Um, yeah, so, oh, and I just skipped a number. Sorry about that. I hit the wrong thing. Um, so one thing I wanted to go over here and really some of the best information available is from the EPA, the US EPA. They have a septic web page. It's uh, just epa.gov slash septic. Um, over the last, I don't know, Septic Smart Week has been going on at least, uh, I want to say 10 to 20 years. I can't remember offhand, but they've been adding resources to this and developing materials, trying to provide um, everyone with access to information that explains, you know, a lot of the new types of technologies for alternative systems, all that sort of stuff, where there might be funding. Um, they have every September the Septic Smart Week, which is uh, this week is September 18th through the 22nd. And if you're a professional, um, this is a time for you to get the word out to the, your constituents, to the septic owners and uh, in your jurisdiction. So if you're with a local health department, um, put something through your social media, um, make offers uh, for testing, maybe even testing a private well. Um, all those sorts of things. Um, but this epa.gov slash septic has a ton of resources. And so I'm going to go through some of that because um, there's really a lot of good information for you if you want to spend the time there uh, to look at all that stuff. So um, just on the about page, if I click on that, it kind of explains all the basics, how it works, um, what types of systems there are. Uh, so if I say, how does it work? It explains it if you're not familiar with that, how it breaks things down, uh, different types of systems. Most people have a conventional septic system, which is a one or two tank, goes to a drain field, um, but there's a lot of other systems out there, especially where it's required because either the soil is inappropriate or um, the geology is such that uh, it will leach into groundwater or an aquifer where the water has to be treated more in a more advanced treatment so that it's not uh, it's rendered harmless by the system before it ever goes out into uh, be distributed uh, in the soil so there's a, a lot of different systems this lists a lot of those aerobic treatment unit i know somebody asked about at or uh, uh, ask about different systems uh, even yeah and if you follow this page down you can see an explanation of what each one of those are. Uh, this is a mounded system where the soil, Jim can explain this a lot better, but where the soil isn't appropriate for drainage or there's not enough of it, uh, the water table's too high, then you mound the system so that there's room for uh, that percolation. There's a lot of webinars available they put together. Um, some of the key ones near the top here are newer um, again, that's just one set of information that's available uh, to look at some of those issues. Uh, under care and maintenance, they've got a full set of uh, web pages here as well to explain uh, why you need to pump, when, um, who to look. You know, so it mentions NAURA here, the National Onsite Wastewater Recycling Association guide, um, a lot of other resources by professionals to help you understand how to maintain things, what not to do. Um, you know, there's, again, this is a, a sprinkler system that they showed in that picture, and then a lot of frequently asked questions, including what you can and shouldn't flush down a toilet, um, and a lot of people do that, I realize. So, yeah, the whole point of this is um, your septic system, from our point of view, we're concerned about how your septic system is affecting uh, the environment and potentially your well, and so they actually have a graphic here explaining that situation, and I like this one because it shows the example I mentioned before um, where the groundwater flow is, even though the well's on one side of the house and the septic's on the other, it turns out groundwater flow direction is from the septic towards the well. And so enough time and enough flow, depending on uh, the natural groundwater flow direction in this case, uh, this is showing how it could affect things. If it's not broken down properly, if it's overloaded, if you're putting other things in the system, um, you could be affecting 
uh, some of those um, issues related to your well. And so it's good to know. Um, and I would say as a rule of thumb, if uh, you have enough soil that you're putting in a conventional system and drain field and there's any slope to the land, uh, your well should go on the upslope side and your septic should go on the downslope side. And that doesn't guarantee anything, but it's uh, more than likely that the water table's following land surface towards a discharge point somewhere uh, lower on the landscape. Uh, each one of those numbers that were in the diagram, there's an explanation here if you follow down the page uh, that kind of gives you more, um, more understanding of what's going on in our system there. There's also a lot of resources related to funding. You know, um, the federal government's got more involved through uh, the USDA now. They had a, uh, a loan program for private wells for low-income folks. They've expanded that. Now it's available to um, for septic systems as well. And I want to mention before I forget that most of the RCAP regions um, are part of the program through USDA, so they can offer these loans. And so whenever there's a, those kind of funding issues, which is a lot of the questions I get, is I forward them to the right region, uh, depending on where they live, and they can you know, work with them then to see if they, they fit for a loan based on income and some of those things. Um, but if you go to the funding page, there's actually a lot of resources. Um, further down this page, it says state-specific funding. And there's also, um, and so if I click on that, uh, it shows me all these different states and what they have. Some of these, like uh, actually the Delaware one I have highlighted is a Delaware internal program, but the one above it, the Individual Household Well and Septic Program, that is USDA's federal program that's being implemented by CERCAP, which is the Southeast Rural Community Assistance Project, um, which CERCAP is the Southeast RCAP. Uh, based in Virginia, they cover the down to Florida, um, and they are a loan provider. And so when I click on this septic rehabilitation loan program, because again, some states like California and Delaware, a few others have separate state programs that may be able to help um, someone who needs uh, a rehabilitation program. I'll show another one. I think it's New York later. But uh, here in Delaware, they've got a program um, on their web page, and it's really meant to deal with cesspools and failing septic systems. So it's a great deal if um, you're in that situation. Uh, so as far as additional resources, um, I wanted to highlight a few things. There's a uh, a lot of technical resources, and I know there are a number of questions about more advanced treatment and you know nitrogen removing. There's a lot of others um, where you you can't release. There's guide. There's guidelines or, or laws in your jurisdiction that don't allow you just to discharge to a drain field because of the uh, makeup of the material. Um, so yeah, there's um, all that's available here. If I click on technical resources then you can see there's a lot of fact sheets about specific types of systems um, and technologies. There's also this advanced on-site technology project products approved by state. And so um, most states have certain rules on what types of technology can be used for your septic, uh, for wastewater disposal or on-site. And so this is a list. Um, you can scroll down this and see what each state has. If they do have any of those um, products that they do have state approval for, um, I picked Idaho here, and this takes me to Idaho's page where you can look at their on-site systems and all the regulations they have there. Um, same way for Massachusetts. Um, I usually highlight Massachusetts in their Title V program because it's um, my understanding is it's one of the most protective in the country. And so there's a, a lot of uh, effort that's going on in Massachusetts. Um, you know, they also have a septic program to help homeowners, uh, I believe. And so I'm just going through their page, but they list labs for testing. They have, you know, whether if it's if for SRF, if there's loans, um, all those sorts of things. Um, but you can go through a lot of this and it walks you right through how to how to learn to care for your system, um, what what you need to do if you're selling your property, all those sorts of things. Um, 
yeah, it's a really good website. Um, the EPA has uh, put out several new, uh, I'll call them clearinghouses um, of information on either technologies or finances or other things. If I click on searchable clearinghouse of wastewater technology, uh, it takes me to this page. There's also, um, it lists at the top that there's really four clearinghouses. There's one specifically um, for on-site and decentralized as well. If I click on that, it takes me to that page where you can look for resources um, and information. Uh, as an example, well, I'm gonna go to the financial one first. Um, if I click on the water finance clearinghouse, there's a couple things here. Um, one is this learning modules they have available. They're really about funding. So there's one for SRF, which is the state revolving funds. There's one for WIFIA, which is also a program for centralized wastewater programs. And then there's one about financing septic systems. So it's just a module you can go through and learn a little more about um, what you need to know and what funding sources might be available. And then um, I also looked at the resources tab and I searched for decentralized information. Septic decentralized was the filter I used. And it came up with a list of 49 documents here. Some of these are web pages, some of these are reports. Um, I picked the one that's for New York. It says State Septic System Replacement Fund. Um, and so when I click on that, it takes me to the page for the New York um, DES and information available there that they put together. Um, for this year, they have $30 million available to help um, for cesspools and substandard or aging septic systems, as it says here. So part of this is you may have resources available to you if you have a problem with your septic system, but the best thing you can do is maintain it and take care of it. And some of these things won't ever be an issue. You won't be looking for someone to help you fund replacing your septic if you do a good job of maintaining it and understanding how valuable it is. Um, if your drain field gets plugged, there's not a lot you can do. You have to have room for another drain field somewhere. In some cases, that's certainly not gonna be possible um, because of the footprint of your property. So um, it's, it's a thing not to make a mistake once. It's because uh, it's not something you can just take out of the ground and stick in place in the same spot. Um, Septic Smart, I mentioned earlier, I'm just gonna go through, uh, they're updating some of these pages. This is um, actually from last year. This may have changed a little bit, but we help participate and so does RCAP and the Septic Smart program. There's a lot of materials available to you if you're a professional or a state regulator or even a local regulator uh, to get the word out about septic systems. Uh, there's this outreach toolkit, which I've highlighted. Uh, there's posters you can order, all kinds of things. Um, there's videos that you can send out on, uh, and infographics you can send out through social media. Just a lot of resources. They've got this home buyer's guide. Um, I know there's one on ATUs I saw earlier today. I was looking through this. Um, but it's all just material that help raise awareness and um, help folks understand um, why they need to take care of their septic system. And so, yeah, uh, you can look for, at that information and EPA that has a place where you can order some of these if you need them um, or some you can just download directly. And um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that was highlighted. They also have a link, I should go back. Um, they link in their septic pages to the private well, um, private drinking water page which is, this is uh, epa.gov slash private wells. Um, our program is funded through EPA, so they highlight us here. Um, the very first link in the related links under free private well training is the private well class. Um, the private well assessments and workshops, the last thing listed there is a link to the six RCAP regions and the well assessments that they do and workshops that they put on. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of information available to you if you're just a little inquisitive and start uh, nosing around these pages. There's also more I'll show you next, but I wanted to mention that all this is tied together. Obviously, um, our program is funded to talk about private wells. Um, we only do this webinar once a year, but it's really important to understand how septic can affect uh, your private well. And that's kind of 
where we fit, fit in in all of this. Um, and there, like I mentioned, there is information widely available. As far as local sources, I would say that your local and county public health department um, likely regulates your septic system or your on-site uh, de decentralized wastewater system. Uh, Co-op Extension has a lot of information available. You can also talk to your licensed septic inspector installer. Um, they're more than willing to help. And I know like in Illinois, some of the county health departments rely on some of those uh, installers to also do inspections for them. So they're contracted out to do that work. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, other resources I wanted to mention, NESI, the National Environmental Services Center at West Virginia University. They have a lot of information on septic. Uh, they used to put out a newsletter um, that provided a lot of on-site information um, as well. Um, so that's a page that's worth taking a look at under wastewater. This is further down this page. Um, a lot of these are links to articles that were in their newsletter um, on different topics. So uh, there's also NAURA, the National On-Site uh, Wastewater Recycling Association. They have, um, this is just one page. If you click on library, you get a drop down and it lists all kinds of different resources. I clicked on the one that's septic resources for homeowners, um, but there's a lot of other information here. I just wanted to show this one page. Um, they highly, uh, highlight kind of a best of, and um, and they have, um, they provide education, not only to professionals, but to others who are interested, as well as uh, do a lot of policy work and other things, so. Um, and if you are in the septic field or you don't have an owner's guide, um, Sarah Hager from the University of Minnesota developed this tool um, where you can go through this process and it'll create an owner's guide for you, what, depending on the type of system you have. Um, it'll, it gives you something that you can have in your hands uh, to better understand what you need to do with your septic system. Um, yeah, I haven't been through this totally. I just, I've heard it's a really great tool. And so we wanted to share it, um, especially, um, I know a lot of septic installers actually use this to create an owner's guide that they can then hand to their customers. And so it's, uh, it's pretty useful to uh, provide O&M and uh, recommendations for those things and describe what components are in your system and all that stuff. Uh, going back to RCAP, um, I wanted to mention that for the private well program, and I've said this on a bunch of our webinars, but we developed um, in cooperation with a bunch of other private well experts, a uh, assessment tool where an RCAP staff person um, will come out to your home and do kind of an assessment of your private well. And it includes um, just a short uh, section 10 here is on your septic system. What kind of tank, what kind of system do you have? Um, if you have an advanced system, you can put other. You know, is it accessible? How old is it? When's the last time you pumped it? Just general questions that they can ask you. Do you have a garbage disposal? You know, uh, so that you can, um, for one, they can educate you about your tank if need be. And two, um, it just raises awareness that, you know, you need to understand your septic tank could be a source of contamination in your well and all those things. Um, and so that's part of a larger assessment. And uh, we've, we needed to include something on septic systems, but it doesn't go into a ton of detail. And so uh, what this does though, it's really, if you're, um, if you're familiar with the sanitary survey for, for public water systems, it's like a sanitary survey for a private well. Uh, it's obviously not binding, it's all volunteer. Um, it's more of a vulnerability assessment, but it also gives then an RCAP professional a chance to educate a well owner about their situation in their well. You know, I've said this a hundred times, rarely are two wells identical. There's always something different about the system, the well depth, the well cap, um, what's being stored near it, where it's at on the landscape. You find so many unique situations every time you visit a private well. Uh, they're, they're just always, there's unique features that need to be dealt with once you see it. And so um, it's, then it's also a chance to promote best practices like why you should test annually, um, and it's also an opportunity for the well owner then 
to understand that you know there's folks out there willing to help you. Um, you know, we get questions or we get people all the time. They're like, I don't want to talk to my health department. They might tell me I can't drink my water. Well, you can ask them if they have that authority. There's only a few small jurisdictions in the country where they actually have given themselves that kind of authority. 99% of the health districts and county health departments in the country cannot tell you you can't drink your water. And so um, our job then is to make sure you understand that. So you, you do reach out to the health professionals that are near you. They're gonna understand your situation better, uh, what natural groundwater quality issues there could be, all that sort of stuff. And so one of the things this assessment does is encourage that communication and helps a well owner understand um, why they should be asking others some of these questions. You know, just like your state geological survey, um, they would be more than welcome to answer any questions you have about the aquifer where your well's, uh, fin well's finished in um, if they have the, that information. In most cases, they would, or in Illinois, the state water survey too. So as far as this program, it's been very successful. They've done over 3,400 assessments around the country in the last six years or so. Um, we also put on a four-hour online workshop um, that is worth CEs for environmental health professionals. Um, we plan to do that late this fall. Um, probably going to do it once this year. We did it last December, but it's uh, it's two parts. It is um, it's about how to use the assessment tool and then also about how to do outreach to well owners. Um, and through that program, and RCAP used to deliver these workshops in person, um, we developed hundreds of contacts and partners uh, around the country um, for supporting the, the work that we do and getting the word out about uh, not only the private well class, but what's available to a well owner uh, for outreach and education to help them learn how to better take care of their well. So, um, I brought all that up because we're in the process of developing a larger assessment tool just for on-site wastewater systems. Uh, we're working with RCAP and NAURA and developing that. Um, it's been through a first draft. We're making edits right now. We plan to have it done um, by the end of this month or so, but we'll have, um, we're planning a webinar to roll it out in September uh, during Septic Smart Week. And, um, It'll include a lot more information about more advanced systems and um, maintenance issues related to some of those. We're seeing more and more of those more advanced systems go in place in vulnerable areas where it's either karst or sandy soils or um, where, where there's, the soil isn't appropriate for a conventional system. Uh, and if you're interested in that, you can just email us and um, we'll I can respond and let you know what's going on there. But eventually uh, that four hour lesson, uh, four hour workshop will include um, that stuff as well, I imagine. So a little bit about the private well class. Um, if you're not familiar, again, these webinars are not the class. There's a 10 lesson class that walks people through um, what it means to be a well owner, how water gets in their well, treatment devices, uh, what to be aware of for maintenance a lot in a lot more detail than we can cover by answering a question today or um, what we can do in an hour and a half or two hour webinar. Um, this is the front page. It's just privatewellclass.org. You click on take our free class or learn by email and it will uh, it takes you to this page where you can sign up. Uh, we ask your first name and where you live is just what state you're in. And again, that's partly just to um, show our funders and others that um, we're reaching everyone in the, in the entire country, and we are. We've had uh, over 11,000 people take the class and uh, from all 50 states, as well as uh, a number of different countries. We even had, yeah, uh, people from all over the world um, have taken our class. So it's also available in Spanish. If um, you work with any native Spanish speakers in your area, um, the entire class is available in Spanish, and so, um, yeah, you can get to that from the other page. For each of the 10 lessons, we've added uh, a set of resources that help explain those concepts. So the first one is the science of groundwater, and so we've included um, a number of documents that are just about basic groundwater hydrology, aquifers, um, 
and kind of well owner guides that help folks understand the basics. And as you move through, lesson two is about groundwater well contamination, so how water flows through the ground, how it picks up contaminants, whether it's natural contaminants, all that sort of stuff. So we also do webinars every month. As I mentioned, um, we try to do the, the septic webinar just once a year in um, July. Um, and so we've done a few on um, special topics like funding and financing. There's actually, we did a newer one than this uh, version, but we asked the USDA folks and um, to come in and then we highlighted not only what funds are available for the USDA program, which has an income limit, but also then other programs like New Mexico has a program for a free water sample if you, um, if through their septic program in the state, because they're trying to identify all the septic systems that they don't have records for. And so they're offering a free water sample that way. Um, and uh, Iowa has a grants to counties program that their state legislature provides funds for either abandoning wells um, or for water testing. Um, and then that money funnels through each county in Iowa, and then it's available to homeowners. And so there's a lot of programs like that, um, either for abandoning wells, getting water samples collected, or um, other things as well as funding for uh, replacement or adding treatment. Um, we did a special webinar twice. The second time was in 2018 on lead. We had um, Kelsey Piper, who's with Northwest or Northeastern University now, uh, who was at Virginia Tech, who did a lot of work with private wells and lead. And um, she was our guest speaker for this. Um, we've um, not done that since because this really covers everything you need to know. And there's actually a lead page that goes with it. Um, that where we've listed resources available. If you're in an older home that has lead solder or lead pipes, or um, yeah, you, or copper, and if it, the water's aggressive, it can leach lead. Um, and so it's good to understand those things and know whether you should you know, have some kind of treatment in place uh, for that. A lot of older homes and rural areas with private wells. And so uh, understanding your water quality is the first step in understanding if you're going to have a lead problem. Um, lead will not leach into your drinking water unless the water is slightly aggressive or corrosive. Um, and so if it's not, then it's, it may not be a problem. But at the same time, you need to know. Um, I want to mention we have a YouTube channel. Um, We've listed everything here, every one of these recordings, all those training videos that we have. Um, if you scroll down the page, you'll see our webinar recordings, last month's outreach strategies for working with private well owners um, is up there. And this will be up there after today or probably by early next week. Um, we've also hosted four conferences where we brought in practitioners, not necessarily researchers, to talk about work they've done uh, with private wells and uh, things that are going on around the country. Uh, we have a drillers panel each time. There's a lot of good information available, especially to professionals, to help you do your jobs and um, do better outreach to well owners. And um, yeah, I, I encourage you to take a look at that. It's a good resource. Uh, I know we've had, we finally reached a million views not too long ago. And so that's kind of uh, a it's a big deal. It's kind of nice. Um, we also have, there's 19 of these training videos that are on a specific topic. Um, how does my pressure tank work? How does, you know, what to do after a flood? What is a sand and gravel aquifer? They're all four to six minutes long. And actually this particular one, how does my private well pressure tank work, is by far the most popular video. I think it's had over 400,000 views. Um, and that's, because there's just not a lot of information out there about uh, how pressure tanks work, and especially the older ones, um, you know, a lot of folks have water pressure problems, and that's either undersized or a system that's undersized in total. If they have two or three stories, things like that, um, you know, nowadays they're going to um, pump on demand, so to speak, where your pump pumps to keep up with use 
and instead of having a large pressure tank where all your water is coming from your pressure tank, now you may have a gallon or two gallon pressure tank just to get your system started. But after that, it's based on um, how much water is being used, how hard the pump uh, will pump out of your well. And so some of these issues are going to eventually go away as those become more common. Uh, another example, shared wells. Um, I know we have shared wells. We even had an issue in Illinois where developers were developing subdivisions in rural areas, putting one well every five homes so they could skirt the rule of being a public water supply but save money on the number of wells they install, not understanding how much trouble that's going to cause necessarily when you have the well is physically on one person's property if it's not written into the deed or there's not a contract for sharing those wells, um, someone could decide they don't want to share with their neighbors anymore. Um, it's probably the second most question I get is about, you know, we have the shared well, we're having an issue, our pump failed, uh, one of our neighbors doesn't want to put up their share of the money, all that sort of stuff. And so um, it's, it's a much bigger problem than I realized uh, when we started this project, you know, 12 years ago. And lastly, we have a, a podcast. We started this a few years ago, um, I guess in August of 21. What we, it's called Tap Talk, the Drinking Water Rural Mod America podcast. We interview folks on both sides of the drinking water spectrum, private wells and public water systems. And the public water system side is really about small system issues. You know, our mission through our other program, uh, in addition to private well class, we have a program called wateroperator.org where we provide resources and support for small system operators, and that's systems under 10,000 people um, for water and wastewater, actually. And so we interview folks who uh, work in those arenas as well on how, um, you know, we might better serve these small communities and help them become sustainable when they're not and that sort of thing. Uh, these four particular uh, folks are all on the private well side of things. Um, Eric Yeggies with the Water Quality Association. Uh, Dr. McDonald Gibson is a researcher at North Carolina State who's done a lot of work with environmental justice and private wells. And um, yeah, all these folks are top of their field. And so there's a lot of interesting information there if you're trying to learn about um, these topics and we recommend you take a look. Um, our whole program, when you put all that together into a package, is really about helping well owners understand why their well is important, why they need to understand how it works, and the things they can do to help protect themselves from risk. Um, a lot of well owners don't have a lot of extra resources, and um, paying someone $500 to come out and measure their water level, for instance, um, isn't on the on the in the cards for them, or you know, paying to have someone disinfect their well if it gets contaminated. And so understanding how to take care of it and being a good steward is really what we hope people get out of this. If we can elevate the overall understanding of well owners about their wells and how to take care of them, uh, that's that's our job, if you will. Um, so I want to go to our questions. We have a lot of them to answer, and, and I think there's going to be there's a few it looks like we already have um, for today. But um, we'll answer some of the questions we got. In advance, obviously not all of them. There were 70 some, I think. But um, if we did ask a question about your state or your rules, I likely didn't put it in here. Um, you can send us an email, and we can look into it. But that's not something um, you know. We have a national audience, and so we try to stick to questions that are more relevant um, outside of a specific state issue or a state uh, regulation. And um, Oh, and I didn't change this. Uh, Katie's not here today. Jennifer will track your questions, which she's doing now. And then again, I want to mention, um, I'm. this is a great webinar for me because I don't have to answer all the questions. Um, Jim's here to do all that heavy lifting, and I'll just, I'll just read him the questions, and he's going to provide the answers. So, Jim, when you're ready, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm ready. Afternoon, all everyone. Right. And thanks again for joining us. Okay, so first question, and there were some really good questions today that really get to some of the topics we've talked about already. Um, over my drain field uh, for my kitchen and laundry septic system, it was installed in 1967, updated in 2020. The grass doesn't grow well, even weeds struggle to grow. So why is this and is there a cure? Um, well, first, first thing I'd say is most likely a septic system is functioning properly because 
you know, well, the fertilizer would be coming up um, from it. If it wasn't, you'd probably have some good grass growing. Um, my hunch is when they did the backfill over the system, um, they just put in really low grade sod. I mean, not sod, um, you know, material, dirt, if you will, on um, topsoil. Um, probably doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it. Um, so, you know, you might consider putting a small layer of, uh, you know, good compost or some other kind of dirt over it with some seed and maybe that would help my, but my hunch is it's just a low grade, um, dirt that was put on top of the system and it's just, you know, doesn't, doesn't have what it needs to have good lawn or any kind of thing to grow in it, if you will. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so flushable and septic safe wipes, are they detrimental to a septic system or are they just inert? They are detrimental. They do. I mean, if they say it's septic safe, um, in my experience, um, you know, flushable wipes and they, you know, say all that things on it. It's not good for any uh, wastewater system, whether it be, you know, centralized going to the, the city run by the pipes or your septic system outside. These things just don't break down like everything else. Really, the only thing going in your septic system really should be you know, whatever's coming out of your body. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's really about it, you know. And whatever's coming out of your body is what, yeah. and just regular water coming down. It's really the only thing you want going into your septic system. You know, you want your, you know, you want to keep food particles out as much as possible and toilet paper, of course. That's that's kind of about all you really want to be putting down there. Yeah, it's amazing how many articles are out there today about these flushables not really being flushable. And that's not just like you said, it's not just septic. It's uh, it's a real problem for community wastewater treatment systems. Um, Big time. People, yeah, it's. Uh, and, and we actually have legislation in Massachusetts pending um, through the, leg the state legislature to make these things not say they're flushable. I mean, technically, I guess they are flushable. That's what happens after they get past the flush. That causes the problem, sure. if you will, <laughs> you know. Um, so there is pending legislation. I think there's even something at the national level, but it's, you know, introduced to, you know, make these things not say like they are, you know, they really should be put into a trash barrel, um, like any other kind of wipe, if you will. They just, they just don't break down like toilet paper does, you know, toilet paper is designed to kind of dissolve once it hits the water and toilet paper also is a, a carbon that, you know, the bacteria breaks down quickly. These are, much more denser material than probably not even, you know, an organic material, more of an inorganic type of thing. All right. So my septic system is a vault that I pump usually every three to four years, and I'm always told it wasn't near filled. So can I begin to flush uh, wheat sweet kitty litter for one cat? I would say no. <laughs> I would still put that in the trash. Um, you know, you might go on to a, a five-year pumping schedule and then see if it's filled up. I mean, I wouldn't change the inputs. Um, if your septic provider thinks you can go longer when nothing changes in your household that, you know, would prompt you to have to pump more than you might, you know, start doing five years and check it, six years, check it. But I wouldn't add any new waste stream to the, um, to the thing. I'm not sure what wheat sweet kitty litter is, but, um, you know, kitty litter is kind of a no, no. I imagine it's kind of a, being wheat sweet, I imagine it's more of a plant-based material than the, the sand that I'm used to for my cat. But still, I'd be uh, hesitant to flush anything down there that's not toilet paper or human waste. <laughs> yeah, I think that's good advice. Okay, so one person in a home on a septic, how often should it be pumped? What things do you need to check, deal with after a flood that has submerged the system? And that's really the second part is why I included this. Um, well, you can answer both, but... Um, yeah, I mean, one person on the system really bases how, how big the house is, um, especially in Massachusetts, based on bedrooms. If you're in a four-bedroom house, it's which is built for eight people and it's just you, then you probably can get away, you know, a good four or five years without pumping. Um, the best thing about that, if you have a if you have a trusted pumper, it's kind of like I said about the last question is, you know, when he's there, hey, could I have gone longer? Should I have pumped shorter? And if you got a trusted pumper, you know, they could say, no, you know, you could probably go four years, you know, and you, instead of three years, you, you know, um, and nothing changes, then, you know, I would go on just basically what they're seeing as they come in to pump the system out, um, you know, proofs in the pudding, if you will. 
And now uh, if you have a flooded system, that's a really difficult situation and something here in the western part of the state and definitely our neighbors in Vermont are dealing with right now is, um, you know, the systems are inundated with water. Um, your leach field's been inundated with water. It's flooded. That's what's accepting your wastewater. And you can imagine if it's been flooded with storm water, there's no room for wastewater. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, these freak nature things, the best thing to do is let it dry out for a few weeks and um, see what you got after it's done. Um, you know, if it's a regular gravity fed system, you know, pumps or anything like that, you should be good. You know, sometimes a flood could take out the pumps that are, you know, pumps or, you know, electrical systems that um, aren't supposed to be submerged. Parts of them aren't, you know, usually submerged all of a sudden it's a flood. So, but um, I think the best thing to do is, you know, give it a little bit to dry out. Um, and then see then kind of reevaluate your system where you're there. Now, if you have a well at the same time and your well was in the day with flooding water, I would definitely you know, be bleaching my well and then uh, and then testing um, for bacteria after the bleach rate wears off because you know most likely your if your well was you know inundated with water and especially crested above where the well cap is, then you know I would definitely take that precaution. Yeah, it's very unlikely that it wouldn't be affected in some way, for sure. Yeah, okay, so I've dealt with a flooding issue in Block Island, Rhode Island. Um, it was right after one of the hurricanes, forget the name, and they got hit really hot, and they had a lot of, you know, septic systems were kind of submerged like this. And, you know, that was kind of the then, too, was, you know, give it two three weeks, let it dry out, then we'll reevaluate. And, you know, a lot of the systems came back to, working order, if you will. You know, you can't evaluate it until it has a little time to dry out through these freak freak storms that are, you know, once in a hundred year things. All right. Um, my septic system has been emptied regularly every two to three years for the past 20 years since my home was built. I am noticing a greener grass over the field. Does that mean anything? And does just emptying the tank alone help the field also? Um, it might mean that the system's starting to um, fail. I mean, after a while, um, you know, you get this what we call a biomat layer that basically just naturally occurs. Um, the bacteria die and break down and just make this mat that becomes impervious. Or, you know, fats or oils somehow make their way through. But little by little, the system's ability or the soil's ability to keep absorbing the water, you know, and comes to an end after a while, you know, depending on how, I mean, depending on how well it was installed, but you know, everything has a, a, a life, you know, and for 20 years, you know, that's, that's a, I think the average system is supposed to be 15, 20 years. So, you know, you got your use out of it. Um, you know, pumping it does, is going to keep it from failing immaturely. Um, you know, hopefully you pump it before those, those solids carry over into that leach field and cause the issues of the clogging might happen. But, even with the most best maintained systems, you know, sooner or later, the system just reaches its end life with that biomat and just the soil just just have, doesn't have the ability to absorb any more water, you know, even if it's been maintained to pristine quality, if you will. Yeah, so that's just a factor of the type of soil they have and all of that stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, it's all site specific, how it was installed, where it was installed, you know, how far the groundwater it is, but Sooner or later, every system, you know, that, that biomat's just going to naturally occur, naturally become impervious, and, you know, that's kind of it. And that's kind of in Massachusetts when we design it. We always kind of have an, um, what they call a uh, alternative or a, a tall alternative um, leach field area, almost like already identified, if you will. That way, when this happens, it's like, okay, we know that's, that's it. that site right there is suitable, it is the area, and it's a lot easier process than, you know, starting from scratch, if you will. Reserve area, that's the, that's the term I was looking for. Sure, sure. All right, and you've kind of answered it, but how often should you have your septic tank pumped? I guess it's really what uh, factors again, go into that. Yeah, it's really, yeah, it's a lot of facts, how big the septic tank is, how many people in the home, the abuse of the system, what you dump down there. Um, so, you know, it's really site specific. Um, I think your chart is a good, good starting point, but I said if you have a good pumper that you trust well you know it might be just kind of trial and error for what's needed for your home you know if you're on a three-year schedule and the guy says you know you probably kind of got another year or two out of it then maybe go to four years and try it again and you got another year great go to five years you know as long as everything in the home stays the same 
you know, the kids moved back from college and, you know, next thing you know, there's five more people in the home than it used to be, you know, then you know, there's different circumstances or, you know, children grow up, become teenagers and take, you know, hour long showers and have friends over and all that, you know, circumstances change. But if everything stays the same, you know, just kind of go, you know, that trial and error, but, you know, Standard is every two to three years. That's what you hear tossed out a lot. All right. Okay, so um, I'm going to answer this question because I we got a comment, and then I you're, I want you I need you to address it. So w the question we got was: Should water softener and pool filter backwash be discharged into a septic system? So um, I'd used this before, and it's from uh, Rhode Island, where they say the backwash brine can adversely affect the septic system. It disrupts settling of solids and um, you know, separation. And so it can cause solids and grease to enter the leach field. It could also lead to clogging and failure. So when you read through this, it says some states, including Massachusetts and Connecticut, have established prohibitions on discharging backwash brine into an on site wastewater treatment system. Um, for this case, they suggest using a dry well. Um, and the other thing they point out here, though, is that. Uh, using that softener brine uh, could void a manufacturer's warranty for, um, you know, an alternative system that has advanced treatment. So we got a comment already in the comments thing saying most municipal ordinances require softener backwash to go into a septic tank. They do not allow dry well for this because that's one of the recommendations. I can't remember if I have another page here or not. Oh, no, I, I did provide this thing from um, NAURA and the Water Quality Association who are, you know, uh, looking at this from the perspective of the septic folks and the water treatment folks. Um, but my question is if, I guess, um, my take on this is no. Uh, I know for Rhode Island they recommend you should put it in a dry well and then we have a comment that says most municipal ordinances require softener backwash to go into a septic tank. They don't allow a dry well. And I, I mean, that's a different state, I would say, clearly than Rhode Island, right? Um, what are your thoughts on all that? Um, well, considering um, most of my work has been in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, which both <laughs> prohibited, um, <laughs> all my experiences is it's a no-no. Um, now, the rules and what I've seen in the field are two different things. Um, doing a lot of well assessments in Massachusetts and also being a Title V inspector, knowing you know what to look for and this kind of stuff. Um, it's you know not that uncommon for me to find uh, treatment systems tied into the septic system. Um, it's you know frequently put in into the the well assessment report that you know under Title V you know that's illegal. You really should put it into a dry well and disconnect it. And I always kind of give them the flurry advice too, you know, before you call the Title V inspector, if you're, home, you're selling your house, you know, call the plumber first and have them remove that because, you know, you're just going to pay for someone like myself to come back twice. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's um, everything I've ever dealt with is that's a no-no. And even in the public water system side, um, in Massachusetts, we have what's called a um, the underground injection control program, a.k.a any of the backwash from a public drinking water system um, treatment system, uh, what can be put in the ground, what can't. Really, the only thing they allow us to do is uh, kind of like a neutral pH um, limestone contactor. Uh, pretty much everything else has to be tight tanked and, and, and uh, pumped out um, if there's any other contaminant coming out of it. Um, seeing a lot with the PFOS coming around, you know, a lot of people are looking at RO or um, ion exchange remove the PFOS problem is now you get a waste stream PFOS what do you do with it then I right. allow you to put it back in the ground it's going to have to be pumped and then now you're talking high strength PFOS what's that going to cost to get rid of <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, um, so yeah I mean uh, unfortunately I don't have any experience um, in any state that doesn't um, that, that allows um, you know anything to go into their, their septic system but we have a prohibition on any treatment system going into the, you know, backwash going in, um, you know, just occasionally RO um, systems that are at the sink, you know, they go they go back to the septic system. Anything the whole house usually is going into a dry well. 
Okay. Thank you. Now, I should say if um, state law requires it, um, local law can't be less stringent. It can be right. more stringent, but not less. So they can't be a right. town to one that says you have to put in a septic because that'd be against the state law, and at least in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. But I've only worked in those two states really in septic. So. All right. Yeah. And I think, you know, that brings up the issue of uh, every place isn't, uh, every state isn't have the same set of rules or it's really like private wells. You know, you have a lot of differences as you go around the country on um, how they're protected and what can be done or not done in an area near a well and all that stuff. So it uh, really depends on where you're at. Okay, moving on. Do you have to have the uh, septic tanks emptied frequently, or is using RIDEX good enough? Um, no, I would say you still have to pump. Um, you know, uh, adding all, um, adding bacteria. You know, I don't. I mean, again, we don't really recommend it. I, you kind of add all the bacteria you need when you go to the bathroom, but um, you know, we still recommend pumping regardless if you have it or you know, adding additives or not. Um, and I haven't really seen the pumping schedule increase because you use it, if you will. You know, oh, I use this so I can only pump every four years. I should do it every two, if you will. I, I haven't seen any um, evidence to support that. Yeah, I looked this up because I used to show a, a diagram that uh, was from Nessie. And then uh, we wrote a blog post about uh, that you know, these additives really don't provide any benefit or a waste of money in a lot of ways. And I've actually gotten emails from folks saying, um, you're wrong. Uh, I haven't had to pump my tank in 20 years. And, um, you know, my advice back to them was, you know, just wait because you're, you're, for whatever reason, um, eventually your system's going to fail eventually. Um, I, so I looked this morning um, at this again, and I even found several companies that sell RIDX that had on their website that it doesn't mean you don't need to pump and that there isn't any evidence that shows that it lengthens the time between when you need to pump. Um, it's about the variety of bacteria in the tank and not, there's not even that much evidence that that's that helpful. So um, I just, yeah, I wanted to get your take on that one this time. Yeah. Um, can the garage floor drain be connected to a septic system? Ideally, I wouldn't want that. I mean, a garage floor drain doesn't sound like a good idea in the first place, um, going into the groundwater at all. Because that's where your, I mean, that's where your cars are installed with all the petroleum products. It's probably where you get your lawn and um, garden fertilizers, pesticides, you know, whatever else you might be using. And none of that you really want in to get in your groundwater, especially if you have a your own well. Um, and I, I, you know, in public water. I've seen even there's like ordinances against even having floor drains in these areas um, for those same reasons, you know, boiler rooms, et cetera, whether the public water system well is, they don't, or, you know, for the same reasons that, you know, oil could get in that drain, gets into the ground, gets into the well. Now what? You know, so right. ideally, I wouldn't want a, a floor drain in the garage at all. There's so much risk and so many chemicals in that room. You know, that's where you keep your cars that are full of gas and oil. And like I said, all the lawn and garden chemicals that, you know, you might use extra gas canisters for the lawnmower. You can imagine all the stuff you have in that room. Even, you know, even um, lawn fertilizing, even if they granule and they hit water, they're not granule anymore. Right. Yeah, I know my garage is full of all the yard chemicals and stuff. and yeah, a gas can and all that. It doesn't seem uh, like it's something you want to, uh, I mean, I, I get the reason for having a drain, um, but in the, today's world where you have to deal with, it's not just out of sight, out of mind. Um, it, having a drain is a risk, I, I would think. Yeah, yeah. yeah if you're going to wash the car, bring it on the driveway. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, I've heard about a system called ATU. Is this a new standard? Any info about the system? So I've heard ATU for two different things. Alternative treatment unit, uh, also an innovative alternative sometimes called, or aerobic treatment unit. Um, 
So I'm going to go with the aerobic treatment unit is what they're asking. <laughs> that's kind of the more common thing. And that's basically a secondary system that adds um, oxygen into the septic tank or maybe even a separate, separate uh, septic tank thing on the system. And adds oxygen usually has a place for those microbes that feel really at home too. And what it's basically doing is just super oxygenating the wastewater. That way it's they can the, the microbes can breed more. More microbes, the quicker the wastewater breaks down. Uh, a lot of these systems are used for denitrification systems because then they have that aerobic nitrification. Then they put it back in a septic tank, gives it an anaerobic environment, denitrification. And that will give you the nitrogen reduction that you're looking for. Um, but I've seen them, you know, used um, just as, you know, extra oxygen. Then go to a leach field, deboxing the leach field. And I've also seen them denitrification. So, but alternative, it's aerobic tre treatment units, basically adding more, um, a way to add more oxygen to the, the treatment than just the, what you get from maybe, you know, the, the stack coming out of your house or maybe, you know, uh, candy cane that happens to be in the leach field, if you will. Sure. Well, and ATU is being used more and more just to speak about alternative systems like you just mentioned, because you, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's so many more alternative systems being put in today than there used to be. Um, Big time. And they all, they have proprietary, proprietary technology. Yeah. And also too, a lot of these are state specific in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. We have testing centers, Rhode Island's and URI in Massachusetts, it's the Barnesville Health um, District, which they have a testing unit on the Cape. And, you know, they test these units and there's different criteria, what they can be used for, um, different variances you can get if you use this criteria. So there's a, you know, without mentioning brand names and stuff, there's so many of these things. So really, you know, you gotta look at where you are located, what state, what's approved and what they go with, if you will. But yeah, there's there a lot of these technologies, is everything from denitrification to, you know, depth the groundwater reduction, how small the leach field can be as, you know, opposed you had to have a huge leach field, now you can have a smaller reduction. So depending on what you're looking at, the technology you're looking at, what's approved for, and if it's approved, <laughs> so without going too far into it. No, it, it's, it's in there. that was, I guess that was my point is that, Today, ATU, if you consider it as alternative treatment unit, um, they're, yeah, it's it's getting a lot more complicated. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, just to remove BOD or to limit mm -hmm. BOD. I mean, it's, you know, some are for phosphorus, some are for nitrogen. It just seems like this. Yeah, I mean, these are, these are many wastewater treatment plants. In your right. Backyard, right. Right. You know, way to really put it you know i mean these are not your your gravity systems that you you know pump every so often forget about these systems also require maintenance they require op usually an operator or a treatment company to come by you know once a year and make sure they're running right they require testing they make alarm. sure they continue to work as required yep. they're going to use more electricity because it's pumps and there's valves and there's other things involved in these things a lot of them not all of them um so there's a lot to be considered. They are a lot more, a lot more complicated than you know septic tank, D box, leach field, gravity fed. You know, <laughs> much more complicated. Right. right. All right. Mass DEP is going to require nitrogen controls treatment on septic systems on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. What components are added to a septic system to treat for nitrogen? Is it an entirely different design from what's typically used in sandy soils with water tables close to the ground surface? Or is there an add-on that can be made to existing systems? I only included this specific one because I knew you knew the answer or you knew a lot about this. Um, yes, I've been uh, keeping my eye on it. I'm based out of Worcester, so I don't, you know, I'm not um, directly um, impacted, but we do do work on the Cape and I've kept my eye on it quite a lot because it's quite a, Quite a change, um, quite a quite a ask down there. Um, as far as the system, well, maybe I should give a little background. Basically, on the Cape, um, we have a lot of uh, called um, kettle ponds, I believe they call them. The ponds on the Cape, um, in the Cape Cod, um, really is one sole aquifer, very sandy soil. It's basically a sandbar. 
And um, because of, because they built a lot of development in the area without sewer, a lot of people are just on traditional septic systems and they're really densely um, built up uh, you know, in the last 50 years. Um, these kettle ponds have degraded greatly because of the nitrogen. Um, they have been, you know, the algae blooms, et cetera. So this has caused um, MassDEP to do this, come up with this regulation. Basically, it's going to make pretty much all the septic systems in quite about a quite about part of the, the Cape and maybe even Southeast Mass as the regulation goes further on, upgrade their septic systems to a denitrification system, um, regardless of sale of property, et cetera. They have five years to do it if you're in this area. No ifs, ands, buts about it. Um, now these systems, what I've seen, most of them, the technologies that I've seen can be added on to the pre-existing septic system. Um, so basically it's another septic tank or two um, on the side, maybe like a control panel type thing or a smaller little thing. But basically these are those, what I was mentioned with the nitrification, denitrification. It will basically bring it into it in a highly oxygenated environment put it back into the septic tank for denitrification, then put it into the leach field you already have, if the, depending that your septic system is properly working now. Um, I'm not gonna say these are cheap, you know, these are gonna be expensive upgrades, um, even though you're not doing your whole septic system on these are, you know, you're still gonna need engineering and getting the installers. Um, after install, it's gonna be more electricity, there's gonna be maintenance, it's gonna be testing. Um, the Board of Health in this area are going to have to keep an eye on all this because um, MassDEP um, writes the law, but most of the enforcement is on the local boards of health, especially for this kind of stuff. So it's going to be a burden on the local boards of health, too. Um, but yeah, like most of these systems are an add on to the existing system as long as it's working properly. Um, there's a, you know quite a few systems that are approved, um, some larger footprint than others, um, without mentioning you know, um, manufacturer names or anything like that. But um, but yeah, the, most of the system you can add on on the side. Now, if you're someone who wants to be proactive and do this forward, I would definitely um, start the process soon. <laughs> I, it's gonna be, you know, quite a rush to get this much units and installers and engineers and, <laughs> and all the others that are going to be required to, uh, you know, electricians, it's going to require electricity hookups most of the time, um, you know, so it's going to be um, quite a quite a feat to make this done in the five-year um, timetable that MassDEP is looking at. Wow, yeah. <clears throat> um, and there's why a lot would more information on um, MassDEP oh. site if anyone wants to take a look at this, but, um, you know, it has the map of the affected part of the Cape, which is basically from the elbow all the way to the canal, everything facing Buzzards Bay. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, next question. Why would it matter if my perk rate is too fast if groundwater is at 600 feet? I imagine the liquid waste from the drain field would filter en enough, even if the waste were to never ever reach that deep. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm kind of with you on that. Um, you know, Massachusetts, we have four feet of groundwater, five or six at some of the higher, you know, the really fast perks. Um, 600, I'd, I'd imagine. <laughs> well, so I, I, Regardless I of how fast the perk rate is, I'd like to think after 600 feet, um, it could be adequate treatment. <laughs> I might be wrong. <laughs> you know, I think we need to know a little more about, um, he says groundwater's at, this person says groundwater's at 600 feet. But that might be where they get their potable drinking water. It doesn't mean there's not a water table um, or yeah. that there's not shallower units that it could reach where it could then move off site. Um, you know, if, if the person who, yeah, I think we need a little more about the well, because I don't, um, I can't think of a place where it's 600 feet before any of the geology is saturated. That, that would I've be a surprise. <laughs> What's that? I've never seen it. <laughs> no. No, and I know, yeah. And so I think, I did, I, you know, I wasn't sure until you started talking about that, it didn't hit me that this is probably where they're getting their groundwater. They may have a 600 foot deep well, but that doesn't mean that's how deep it is 
to actual the water table. And so, yeah, if um, the person who asked this question would want to email me, we can talk more about that or give us a call. Um, I think we need more information to be able to answer that, to be honest. So, okay. Uh, is there any harm to a seldom used, lightly used septic system, like at a summer home, or if you leave on an extended vacation? Any precautions here? Um, I'd be more concerned with the summer home. Um, like we mentioned, that you know, it's the septic system is really based on bacteria, and um, you know, the bacteria uh, kind of need us to survive, if you will. Um, you know, so it's like a summer home. You have Memorial Day from Labor Day, maybe. You know, you're three months on, nine months of uh, no flow, no food, no heat. Um, you're really starting from scratch every year. You know. It, don't, you know, especially in a cold environment, um, you know, the colder it gets, the slower microbes are going to do their thing. Um, one thing about, you know, being in use is every time you flush the toilet or turn the sink on or whatever it might be, you're putting warm water in there and you're also putting food in there for those microbes to continue on. Um, you know, when you close it up on Labor Day and go away for nine months, most likely you're, you know, put it, you, you know, everything's going to kind of die out or at least go into uh go to sleep for nine months so you're almost kind of starting your system fresh um so you know it's probably not a good idea to have a 30 person party on memorial day weekend <laughs> you know until the system kind of gets a little up and going uh, I've, I've seen that in coastal maine happen a few times you know problems people renting houses and um just in summer use and then the people they rent to have a big bash and next thing you know uh system can't take it because um, it's going from zero to a hundred um, you know a long vacation in your home you know a week or two I think that you, it's septic tank be fine it's just when you go on months on end and especially in a cold climate where there's you know no heat and the ground's getting cooler those microbes are really gonna stop doing their job or die out because there's nothing to eat if you will because once you uh, stop giving them food there's no other food coming in sure all right. Um, I recently moved into a new built a new build home, and I want to do some landscaping and add a gravel fire pit area in the backyard. What are the limitations of landscaping within the septic field area? I would definitely not put a gravel fire pit on there. Um, your your leach field might be made with PVC, and uh, PVC and fire they don't really mix. They might melt. Um, ideally, on a leach field, really it should be just grass, passive um, recreation. I mean, anything you're gonna put on it, um, you know, sooner or later, you might have to move it for maintenance or you know, something fails or whatever it might be. Um, so, you know, ideally it should be passive recreation. If you wanna you know, have a football game on it, you know, or put a temporary tent up, you know, with a, with a um, picnic table, stuff like that. But, you know, any like um, permanent masonry, definitely not a fire pit you don't want to put any kind of fire on it um gardens don't i would stay away from gardens too if they fail you know you're gonna have you know waste water going to your onto your greens it's just not good and at the same time too you're watering a your garden which adds more water into that leach field area which you want to you know keep as dry as possible unless it's going to rain or you're putting you know waste water into the system so all right um why do some septic systems have two or three tanks and alarm systems? Is there an advantage for the cost add? My daughter has this type of system in Washington. It, could it be due to local requirements or poor drainage? Sounds like you have a pumping system. Um, sometimes it's to the the poor drainage. They got to pump it up to you know a mounded system like it has that um, some brought in material for that first two, three, four feet of. Uh, leaching into the ground um you know so it's usually that second or that third tank is a pump chamber and um it has a float in there and there's an alarm system that's inside the house so when that pump fails there's an alarm so you still have some time before that pump chamber fills all the way up because once the pump chamber fills all the way up septic tank fills all the way up there's only one way to come and that's back in the house um because they can't make it to the leach field because well that pump pumping it up upstream to get into that leach field they can't get there 
So my guess is that's what it is, is um, it's a pump. The raised system most likely due to drainage or the leach field area that was suitable was higher grade. And, um, you know, that third, that second or third tank you're looking at is that pump chamber that's bringing it up to the leach field. And that alarm system is just in case that pump fails. Okay. All right. So we do have a number of questions that folks have asked. Um, so I'm going to pull that over on top of uh, what we're doing here. And um, let me know if you can see that. Jim? Yep, I can see it. All right. So uh, these are, uh, thanks, Jennifer, by the way, for put, compiling all that. Um, how deep should the port or manhole be buried, or should it even be completely buried? I think it should be the grade. Um, I wish that was code, actually, for even the new systems that, um, you know, the, the manholes go to grade in the septic tank. It's at least the um, outlet of the septic tank where you can see, you know, where the action is going out, if you will. Um, I think it would go a long way if we had them to grade. But, um, but yeah, ideally, I think they should be um, to grade with a good manhole on top. So to, currently they can be below grade? Oh, yeah, and they frequently are. Even yeah. new builds, they're not required to have manholes to grade. Ideally, I think they should, though. It's just going to encourage more maintenance. Sure. All right. Um, is there a good way to winterize a distribution box for systems that are not used regularly in the winter? Not really. Um, usually the D box isn't that deep either. Um, I mean, the only way really is the um you know is to continue to have the flow to keep it warm if you will i mean a d box really shouldn't have that much water in it though because anything that hits the d box should be draining right out so that should have a very small layer at the bottom if anything you know if you open your d box and it's full and there's no flow going into the d box your leach field is, is failed that's the problem there so mm -hmm. ideally you know the septic tank is really where the water is going to hold for a while the d box really shouldn't have if there's no flow going into the D box, there shouldn't really be any water in the D box, if you will. Okay. Um, I live on 40 acres and have a note that I have a 62 ton septic system. What does that mean? Um, elsewhere, it says it's a thousand plus gallons. <laughs> I've never heard of a 62 ton no. <laughs> septic. Oh my. I... That sounds like a very heavy septic tank. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I can't imagine how much concrete or whatever it would take to be 62 tons. Um, yeah. Wow. I, I would say it's probably a thousand gallon, maybe 1500 tank, um, kind of the standards, if you will. Yeah. Um, huh. Yeah, I haven't said they live on 40 acres. You know, I grew up on a farmstead that was 40 acres, but. The area where our house was and our septic was was you know about half of an acre and so i don't um I, i'm just wondering if there's something missing that wasn't mm. providing this question but uh anyway can septic inspections help identify failing drain fields like biomat formation um yes they couldn't tell you exactly what is causing the the drain field, but like I mentioned about the D box, if you can get into the D box and take a look there, it's the best way to see if there's a problem with the drain field. Um, because you know, if the water coming is not draining out of the D box and there's no water going into the D box, and it's then there's something wrong with the leach field. Ideally, anything goes in the D box and equally distributed, just go right into the ground, if you will. Um, so if it's not going in the ground and it's just kind of sitting there stagnant most likely you've got a problem with your leach field. Now, is that biomat or some other thing that is causing the, you know, the drainage to stop? I don't know. Um, I've seen it, you know, it'd be as simple as someone used the wrong sand and gravel underneath the leach field when they installed it and it's too much silt in it. The silt's finally got into a way that they shut off the leach field and boom, there it is. So yeah. it could be biomed, it could be silt, it could be abuse from fats and oils. Um, the only way to really know exactly what's causing it is to kind of dig down into that leach field and next to the pipe and you know see what's there, if you will. All right. Um, 
what are the options if one's biomat and it says fails here but if if it creates a biomat that seals it off and there isn't enough room due to other buildings for a new alternate leach field um well there is some companies and um one some technologies approved the mass that they, if it is a biomat option um or like a fog that they say they have the technology between adding oxygen to the septic tank and um, some additives to remove that. Um, barring that, um, you know, you probably would be looking at an alternative septic um, system kind of upgrade to make your system a smaller footprint, if you will. Or sometimes even if you don't have the right soils, you got to bring in the soils from elsewhere and put them in place. Um, so there's a well, there's a way, there's variances, there's lots of technologies. However, you know, these all cost money. Um, you know, the, the more technology, the more variances, the more things you're looking at, most likely the more cost it's going to be up front and moving forward. Because, you know, once you start putting an alternative system in, there's a lot more maintenance involved as just bumping every three to five years. Well, I would think if you're going to basically take out the old system and add, bring in new dirt to depth below the biomat. Uh, you still have to get rid of all that for one, but two, yeah, you're, that's a lot of dirt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then, then that's, it's coming, becoming even more expensive. Like Marin Title Five fill is you know, pretty pricey now. Even piping, yeah. it's just the regular piping has gone up considerably. Huh. Um, what's the consensus on of having a hydrogen peroxide based water treatment system? Um, well, um, what we've seen is that certainly hydrogen peroxide can be used uh, instead of chlorine for treatment, for oxidizing things. Um, it's a little more dangerous to use and um, for a typical homeowner, it's probably, uh, it's a lot more volatile. And so the system is uh, much more tricky to run to actually work properly. Um, we we haven't really tried to use any hydrogen peroxide systems um, in any homes. We've seen where communities have tried to add hydrogen peroxide um, as an option like for oxidizing um, iron and arsenic and things like that. But um, if you know of a system that's out there that's actually using hydrogen peroxide, I know you could see stuff online. Our, what we've figured out is that they cost a lot more and they're very hard to maintain properly. Uh, and there's they're actually more of a safety risk. And I don't know, Jimmy, you know anything about hydrogen peroxide systems? No, I've um, never had any experience with any of that. So. Yeah, yeah, and I I know, you know, in theory, the chemistry works really well, and the byproducts are, you know, there's no risk of any, you know, like uh, with chlorine, you have disinfection byproducts if there's any uh, organic matter and things like that. But, um, you know, it it's dangerous to use, for one. So... Um, and that's my understanding. Uh, we looked at it. Uh, yeah. Um, so I don't, I think that's why you don't see it as a common option, even though the, you know, the, it breaks down into inert things. Yeah. That's the only advantage. Um, yeah, that's all. That's really all I know about there. Um, so the question, as a follow-up, I guess, uh, would you recommend ATUs for a homeowner? Um, only if you That's, have a need. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I, if you if you can get away with a good old gravity-fed system, then stay with it. Um, these are really for those situations where it calls for it. Um, you know, the denitrification of Cape Cod, um, an upgrade in... You know, the current regulations are completely different when the house was built in the 50s and you just don't have the footprint. Um, but if you don't need to have one, I wouldn't get involved in one because, like I said, it's just more more money, more maintenance, more problems. 
more things that can go wrong. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. There's a lot more moving parts. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. It's a lot to it. Um, I mean, I've seen them work very well. I mean, I've seen denitrification units that put water into the ground that meets drinking water standards, you know, so um, they work very well. But again, as a regular homeowner, unless you need one, I wouldn't voluntarily get one. <laughs> well, and yeah, I think, you know, you could read this question to be like, is it being more environmentally sound if you did this? And I would say the technologies aren't there to make it, um, you know, I, what's the right, I'm not sure the right way to say it, but it's 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 really not at a point where it's a comparable option, and you only see it where you have to have it. Correct. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And basically, and, and, basically, where the traditional systems aren't working, like we mentioned with yeah. Cape Cod. Yeah. I mean, we have the traditional systems in; they just don't work. It's a sandy soil. It's a soil aquifer, and it's you know we're densely built down there. And, you know, we got built up tremendously in, um, over the last 50 years. No wastewater plants are put in other than like the big towns where Barnstable, Province, you know, Provincetown, everyone else, you know, just has septic systems and they just, they don't work enough. And that's kind of the hence why DP went forward. Um, but if you're, you know, the 40 acre person and, uh, you know, well, private well is far away and you're not next to a lake or anything, I would just go traditional. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I would say that as these regulations start becoming more common and we learn more about um, where there might be vulnerable geology that's causing some contamination, um, we're going to see more and more of these type of units. But again, it's all going to be driven because a traditional system is an environmental problem or um, it doesn't you know, do what it's supposed to do and you are you know, causing contamination somewhere. But you know, a traditional system in a normal situation does what it's supposed to. You're not contaminating anything per se. Okay, my neighbor's contractor inadvertently drove heavy equipment over our leach field. How soon would we know if it caused damage? Um, oh wow. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, it would take how long if the pipes underneath are broken. That means your leach field capacity, you know, depending on where they drove over it, has been cut. I don't know how my how much. Um, my to make sure everything is intact, you may consider um, having a wastewater plumber, um, or even a septic company, even a plumber, just that has a, a snake with a camera on it from the D box into your leach field. Just look at each one of the pipes, just camera it right down. Um, if they're crushed underneath. We got a problem. You know, you don't have to wait to the water doesn't go into the ground anymore. You know, they broke the pipes, they fixed the pipes. If there's any tire marks, you know, definitely take a look at those. Do those tire marks coincide with the broken pipe right underneath? Because most of these cameras will have almost like a, a GIS monitor type thing. So you know where it is in the pipe, in the surface, if you will. And if you look, you know, you know, he drove over it, you have proof of the thing, and now you have a broken pipe. I mean, it's pretty much um, done deal. They broke it. They should fix it. Um, hey, they already have the contract and uh, you know heavy equipment, so it shouldn't be that hard. Hope they do septic installs. <laughs> <laughs> but I would definitely camera the law, the the lines, and make sure you're good there. I mean, it, you know, for the hundred or two, it might cost you the camera line. Could you know, uh, you know, save you a disaster down the road. That's a good idea. Um, I've been told not to use bleach when washing towels because it will ruin my septic. Is this true? And yeah, does using household routine chemicals affect your septic system? I mean, if you're doing one load of wash with bleach and then, you know, and it's, you know, and I don't think it would be that big of a deal if you're doing, you know, 10 loads of bleach all at once, you know, <laughs> Um, now, using other chemicals that you might be using, ideally, you don't want to dump waste other products down. The, you know, if you're mopping the floor with a disinfectant and you got, uh, you know, half a gallon of solution left, you really don't want to dump that into your septic system. Um, where do you dump it is the question. <laughs> you know what I mean, but um, 
Yeah, you want to kind of limit any kind of disinfectant you're putting down there um, as much as possible. But I mean, at the same time, we do still, you know, need to, you know, live a hygienic life, I guess. <laughs> well, and a lot of, if there's if it's an established system and there's layers of bacteria, yeah. um, it's much more likely to hurt those on top, if you will, and not necessarily get through the entire mad biofilm right mm -hmm. exactly and bleach too is um you know if i understand about the disinfectant is kind of one of the least problematic to a leach field because you know once the chlorine gets used up it's you know in it's a, ineffective you know like a quaternary ammonia that thing just keeps going you know it doesn't it doesn't wear out it just keeps killing <laughs> if you will so that's a good point all right, uh, if it's not too late, what are your thoughts on pipe and gravel versus chambers? Does one last longer? Under what conditions would you recommend one over the other? Yeah, these are. I, I've seen them both work um, a long time. It's really on how they installed. You know, it, you know, I've seen them both work for you know 50 years plus. Some of them. Um, it's really how they're installed, where the location is. One thing about the gravel too has it been triple wash no fines that's a huge thing um i've seen a lot of septic systems fail just because they put the wrong material in. they you know don't put in the triple washed gravel so the fines are there the fines sooner or later find their way to the bottom become a impervious layer and boom there goes the system so i wouldn't say there's a winner out of both you know but um you know i've seen them both work so long so it's really i wouldn't recommend one over the other and same thing, trench over the beds. I've seen them all work. Traditionally, I've seen different systems work. I've, you know, I've seen some innovative alternative chambers work worse than others, without calling out different names. But you know, but it, it's you know, there's a lot of manufacturers out there too that do their own, you know, chamber setups now. So you know, it's hard to say what's what. All right. And a comment that we had, um, we already addressed. So that's uh, Jim. Thanks again. Um, no problem. This is very helpful. I learned a lot today. I appreciate it. And um, if you are looking for continuing education credit, uh, email us at infoprivatewellclass.org. Make sure you get the handouts you need there. Um, this was pre-approved for two CES. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can also email us at infoprivatewellclass.org. Or in a couple hours, there's going to be a follow-up email that's automatic about thanks for joining us today. I think that has my email address. You're welcome to email me if you have a question. Um, yeah, that's uh, our, what we have for today. Um, thanks for everyone who joined. And uh, Jim, yeah, I look forward to see you in a few months. All right, everyone take care. Yeah, when I turn this off, Jim, I'll, I'll lose you. Just FYI. All right. All right. Take care. Talk to you soon, Steve. Have a good one. You too.